6. She considers skipping the women's hadith lecture at the center tonight. No one else has called since she'd hung up on Sabrine Khalil. The silence feels dangerous. Not a word from Umm Zureyb either. Does she resent Afaf's involvement or do they consider it meddling? Afaf decides to go and confront the inevitable. Hiding suggests she's done something wrong. Her call to DCFS was mandated by law. She'd made a choice, hadn't left it to another staff member to intervene. Afaf pulls into the parking lot as the last strokes of orange and pink brush the horizon. November has begun to rob the day of hours. The black alder trees that line the sidewalk around the mosque have grown to their adult size since its, since its construction. Their leaves are now brown. The Tempest Prayer Center still takes her breath away. It was built in the image of the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem. The golden dome flashes in the daytime and its arched window glows at night. Like the one in the painting of the old man carrying the holy city. It's like an ancient relic plopped down in the middle of white suburbia. It faces a main road, brick houses with tidy landscapes behind it. Afaf remembers how proud Baba was at the ribbon cutting ceremony years ago, standing beside the Imam and the other men who'd brought him back to life. It had taken much time and patience to overcome the racist bureaucracy of Tempest, where they'd found an affordable plot of land. It was originally zoned for both residential and institutional, a church or recreational center. The attorney hired on behalf of the center had strenuously pointed out the fact to the town board members who protested a religious center despite the presence of a Lutheran church only three blocks away. There are two archway entrances. One leads to an enormous prayer room for men. The women go through the other, which takes them down a spiral staircase to the lower level. Slabs of white marble cover the floor. The first level contains a large office where the imam performs al-kitab for couples before their wedding, or he ministers or he ministers to feuding families haggling over ancestral land overseas. Blue geometric flowers pattern the walls and large mosaic windows windows filter soft light indoors. A recreational building has been added since the original construction, including an indoor basketball court and meeting rooms. And more progress followed. A few miles away, Nuruddin School, once an old convent, opened its doors with the sponsorship of Ali Abu Nimir, offering families a way to maintain their faith while educating their children. But there were also a few steps backward, like the refusal to integrate the sexes at popular community events or forbidding any discussion of contraception. And now, Leila, silencing her to protect the little girl's father, feels like another antiquated practice that she'd ultimately defied. Afaf hopes the consequences aren't too harsh. In the lower level, she slips off her shoes and places them on a large shelf against one wall. The lecture begins after Salat al-Maghrib, the sunset prayer. She performs wudu in the communal washroom, greeting other Muslimat who crouch beside her on the tiled floor, holding plastic containers, water streaming beneath them to, lar to a large drain. A young girl stands with bleached white towels, smiling with missing teeth. Afaf finds a spot next to Kokab. Her friend tugs at the elastic waistband on the bottom half of her prayer clothes. She looks like a large, unsteady barrel. Most of the women wear prayer clothes that completely conceal their forms, while others attend in long-sleeved abayas with glittering designs. What's wrong? Her friend whispers. Afaf hasn't told Kokab what's happened, though her friend immediately senses something's wrong. Afaf shakes her head and she squeezes her friend's hand, attempting a smile. Umm Zureyb is at the front as usual, seated on a chair because she's unable to stand for long or get into a prostrate, prostrate position. There's a special row designated for her and the elderly women. Umm Musaji, the oldest woman in their circle, who'd fled the Israeli forces in 1948 and lived in a refugee camp in Lebanon for 30 years. Umm Wahab, whose two sons fled the States for, after committing coupon fraud at their grocery store. And Umm Muhammad, 
whose husband had given the highest undisclosed sum to the construction of the mosque. Affaf wishes Umm Zureyb would turn around and see her, give her a reassuring nod. The old woman stares straight ahead, her rapt head poised in the direction of the loudspeaker from which the imam's voice will bellow, leading the congregation in prayer. Affaf scans the room again, two dozen women readying themselves for worship, their hands folded over their stomachs, right over left. There is no sign of Sabrin Khalil. Relief washes over Affaf and she tries to relax and focus as the Imam recites the opening. Subhanakallahumma. For a few minutes, Affaf is comforted by the bodies that surround her, their faith emanating each time they raise their hands and kneel on the floor. A sense of clarity floods her brain and tingles all the way to her fingers and toes. By the second rak'ah, Affaf breathes deeply, a calm settling deep in her bones. She can momentarily forget her frustrations, let go of the uneasiness she was carrying before she began her salat. The first time Affaf prayed within these walls, she could smell the fresh coat of paint. She'd stood between Kokab and her mother and sisters, Umm Zureyb taken her place permanently at the front line. By that time, Affaf had learned to pray on her own and had fasted every day of Ramadan, except for a week during her period. Now, as her forehead touches the blue carpet, she's overcome by that first sense of optimism that had been ignited in her years ago. When Affaf approaches Umm Zureyb after prayer, her optimism completely dissolves. She searches for understanding in the old woman's eyes, cataracts clouding the corners, but she finds none. He had planned to meet with the Imam, Umm Zureyb informs her. Because he was caught? Affaf's cheeks flush hot. Umm Zureyb ignores her pointed question. It's out of our hands now. Layla and her brothers and sisters are in foster care with American. Not with their own people, is what she means. That they'd been yanked out of their family surroundings as unstable as they were, out of their mother's arms, precariously dropped into the homes of people who don't understand them. What if the women are right? What if she'd sent Layla and her siblings to a worse fate? It's difficult to look into a Muzareb's eyes, she doesn't blink, the kindness gone from her eyes like stars dimming in a night sky. He was beating them, Affaf whispers. I had to call. Umm Zureyb kisses her on both cheeks. You did what you believed was best. Only Allah will judge. She limps away, a few women greedily vying for her attention, guiding her to a chair for the lecture. Affaf sinks to the floor and wraps her arms around her knees. Umm Musa begins the lecture with an excerpt from the Holy Prophet's hadith. Whoever keeps a secret, whoever keeps secret a shameful deed done by a Muslim, God will grant him his cover on the day of judgment. Seven. Majid comes home for the weekend. He must have sensed Affaf's misery over the phone on Friday. She's back from morning errands and finds him at the kitchen table with Mama, holding her hand as she smokes her cigarette. This closeness still makes Affaf jealous. She can see how, if only for a short time, Majid can sweep away the cobwebs of depression hanging so delicately over Mama, which she and Baba have not disturbed. Her own husband and daughter have been an awful disappointment, but her son can still make her smile. Majid hugs Affaf. His hair is cut short and neat. His face is lean. His hazel eyes are more mischievous. She tries to picture him with a family one day, a beautiful Muslimah at his side, but the image doesn't fully materialize. His rejection of Islam is mostly quiet and respectful. He lets Baba talk at length about redemption and the blessing of marriage to a woman who will raise his children to be good Muslimin, 
Majid only nods, though sometimes Ataf catches him scowling when Baba mentions the sin of alcohol. He's lecturing me, he tells Ataf in private. It's not lecturing, Maj. He knows firsthand how he can destroy you. Her brother snickers. A few beers with friends? I don't buy it, Ataf. Men do far worse than that in the name of religion. She's found she can still be close to Majid as long as they don't discuss religion. Afaf recites extra dua for her brother at the end of each prayer, hoping he'll see the path Allah has lit for him. Couldn't he see how it had transformed his own sister? Was her brother's memory so short? Now Majid pulls her into his arms, touches a fold in her headscarf. Look at you, sis. I didn't think you could do it. She hugs him tightly and he lets her hang on. Could or would do it? He laughs. Would, I guess. How does it feel? Afaf pulls back, self-conscious all of a sudden. She can read it on her brother's face. Majid thinks she's been brainwashed too, like all the women he believes have been duped into submission to worthless men. Mama goes to the stove, sprinkles cumin into a simmering saucepan, though, she's, though she meant to use allspice. Ya Rabbi, she snaps. She slams cabinets and clanks dirty dishes in the sink. Afaf ignores her noise. It feels fine. I mean, it was a little weird in the beginning, but I'm getting used to it. She doesn't tell him about the sneers and heckles at the gas station or the uncomfortable foreboding looks from her colleagues. Mama throws down a spoon. It clatters against a plate. You're a fool, Afaf. A stupid, stupid girl. She throws her head back and laughs, trying to light another cigarette with sopping wet fingers. Mama, come on, have a seat. Majid placates her, placates her with a new cigarette, guiding her to a chair. He places it in her mouth and lights it. How long has she been like this? He mouths to Afaf. She shakes her head. Afaf tries not to resent her brother. Majid's been spared the daily challenges of life with Mama, her eruptive anger, sudden and consuming, or her vacuous stare when she doesn't speak for a whole day. He'd, learned his, he'd earned his scholarship, had worked hard every day of his education, but none of it changes life at home. Her brother escaped, leaving Afaf behind. Still, her mother pines for the ones who are gone, Nada, Majid, denying her and Baba, the ones who have stayed. Mama catches their silent exchange. What are you whispering about me? She throws her cigarette in the sink. Do you think I'm stupid, that I don't see what's going on? I know more than you'll ever know. What do you know? Afaf counters. Rarely does she engage her mother's outbursts. She wants to shout that Mama doesn't have a monopoly on suffering, but Majid grips her arm. Mama stands close to Afaf, her breath stinking of cigarettes and coffee, her body musty. You think you're so special now, wearing that thing, huh? If I wear one, if I wear one on my head, will Allah bring Nada back? Will this misery finally end? Afaf is stunned by the mention of her sister and she turns toward Majid, who looks like he's been slapped in the face. An invisible presence suddenly fills the kitchen, pressing against Afaf. Before either of them can respond, Mama lunges at Afaf, clawing at her headscarf. A pin she'd, been, a pin she'd securely fastened on one side stabs her skull. Majid pulls Mama off of her and Afaf stumbles backward against the stove, knocking the long handle of the saucepan. Boiling liquid sears her arm. Afaf, cold water, her brother commands. He guides her to the kitchen sink and gently rolls up her sleeves. Fortunately, the fabric, ha the fabric has absorbed most of the scalding soup, but her arm turns pink. Afaf winces, but she refuses to cry as their mother watches. Wild-eyed, Majid firmly holds her elbow under the running water. Don't move. Her eyes are trained on Mama, afraid her mother will attack her again. 
Mama stares vacantly at the mess on the floor, the tomato liquid dripping down the front of the stove. She takes a step toward Afaf and Afaf flinches, alerting Majid, and he looks up. Mama, her brother says, it sounds like a question, like she's, some, like she's someone he no longer recognizes. Their mother mumbles something before turning and disappearing into her bedroom. The television goes on, volume raised. Majid won't look at Afaf. He's concentrating hard on her arm, though she can feel his indignation. As soon as Mama closes her door, Afaf sobs. The cold water temporarily soothes her burned pores. Her skin still throbs. A patch of blisters has, has cropped up. But she's suddenly relieved by this physical attack, like she'd been holding her breath for the last 20 years. Mama has finally struck out at her. Afaf has nothing more to fear. Baba comes home with Fatayr, special treats for Majid's visit. He's shocked by the scene in the kitchen, Afaf's brother mopping up the mess on the floor, her arm wrapped in a sheet of paper towels. Only an hour before, Baba had left them in good spirits. La la la. Baba carefully examines Afaf's arm and insists they go to the ER. His musbaha dangles from his jacket pocket and she wants to pull it out, to hold on to something to keep her from trembling. It's fine, Baba. I... Alhamdulillah, Afaf stammers. Majid put some ointment on it. Forgive your mother. She's not well, Habibti. He places both hands on her shoulders. Be merciful to others and you will receive mercy. Forgive others and Allah will forgive you. She wants to tell her father to stop preaching to her that Mama is the one at fault, the one who's ruined their lives. Is there a verse in the Quran that speaks about such losses? Has Baba memorized that one too? Afaf drops her head, looks away from Baba's watering eyes. Despite her anger, she gives silent dua on behalf of Mama. She's doing everything she can to be a good person, and at every turn, Mama tries to derail her. Does that loss, does the loss of a child negate the existence of another? Is Afaf's life not worthy too? A noise wakes her. It's like a gurgle, like water down a drain. Afaf turns over in bed, forgetting about her burned arm, immediately wincing in pain. She sits up and smooths down the edges of the bandage. Her digital alarm clock blinks. 4.30 a.m. A sound again. She checks the hallway, holding her arm like a broken wing. It's dark except for a thin slice of light beneath the bathroom door. She knocks, expecting Baba to answer, though it's still too early for Fajr wudu and prayer. Hello? The strange gurgle comes through the door. Afaf turns the knob. Mama is lying in the tub, which is half full with water. She's completely naked. Mama! Afaf screams. One slender arm dangles out of the bathtub. There's an empty bottle of Drano on the floor. Chunks of vomit float on the surface of the water along her mother's splayed legs. Khair, inshallah. Baba pushes Afab out of the way. Muntaha! Muntaha! What have you done to yourself? Majid appears in the doorway. What the fuck is happening? Call 911! Afab shouts over her shoulder. Hurry! Baba, help me pull her out. Baba and Afaf hoist Mama out of the tub and she forgets about the pain in her arm. Though she's no more than 120 pounds, Mama's body feels bloated and heavy like a bag of soaked rice. Water streams from her deflated breasts down her still flat stomach. Her pubic hair, still dark and full against her pale skin, looks like a bird's delicate nest. Baba carefully sets her head on the tiled floor and strokes her loose hair. 
Her arms flop at her sides like a rag doll. He shouts, Muntaha, wake up, wake up, my love. Mama, open your eyes. Yalla, Mama. Afaf slaps her mother's cheeks, a flutter of movement beneath her lids. Come on, Mama. Wake up, wake up. Majid hands her a towel and Afaf covers her up. They're on their way, he says. Yalla, Mama, you need to open your eyes. Will she be okay? Majid's eyes are wide with the same terror Afaf recognizes when they were kids that night they heard the detective telling their parents about a body found at the old stockyard or at the hospital when the police officer suggested that Baba could have died in the crash. Afaf listens to Mama's chest. Her heart beats softly but steadily. A siren wails in the distance, then a thunder of footsteps up the staircase, staircase to their floor. Before they have a chance to knock, Majid lets the paramedics in. Miss, give us a room. A female paramedic orders. Afaf gently places her mother's head on the floor. You all need to stay in the hallway so we can help your mother. She places a stethoscope in her ears and leans over Mama's chest. She looks up at Baba. Sir, is this your wife? Sir? Baba's face is ashen. Afaf grips his arm and he gives a weak nod as if in, as if in acknowledging it he'll be blamed for her near death. Any idea how long she drank the liquid? Any idea how long ago she drank the liquid? Baba shakes his head again. Afaf's pajama top is soaked through and she touches her bare head, realizing the male paramedic has seen her without a hijab. But he's not paying attention to Afaf. He's busy covering, covering Mama's nose and mouth with a respirator while his partner checks her blood pressure. They lift her onto a stretcher and strap her in. Afaf clutches the wet towel to her chest. She can still feel Mama's heartbeat against her ear like a faint drum. Eight. Baba parks in an underground garage and they climb out of the car. The cacophony of slamming doors eerily amplified inside the cement structure. They enter a different wing than the last time they were here, after Baba's crash. How terrified Afaf and Majid had been that night in the ER. Baba holds the elevator and the three of them enter. Afaf searches the directory of floors on the laminated placard. Level 3, Psychiatric Health and Care A week later, Mama's transferred from the poison unit. Afaf wonders if this is the floor where Mama had stayed when she had had a nervous breakdown. Is that the natural sequence of events? She wonders. You lose a child, have a nervous breakdown, attempt suicide. And how do you go back to your life when you've failed at ending it? Do you simply wait for the misery to swallow you up one day? Afaf had heard about Arabiyat drinking Drano or Mr. Clean, trying to teach their cheating or abusive husbands a lesson. She'd once overheard Khalti Nasreen telling Mama about a woman she knew from Milwaukee who'd succeeded. Her own children came home from school and found her lifeless poisoned body curled on the floor. A white couple, a white couple enters the elevator behind them. They stare at her and she instinctively touches the hem of her hijab a habit she's developed. She's growing accustomed to it, even forgetting she's wearing it at times until others remind her with their furrowed brows and pursed lips. They stare at Baba too, with his skull cap, his musbaha looped across his hand. She can sense Majid's body tightening, readying, him, readying himself for a fight. Afaf hooks her pinky finger on his and gently tugs it, restraining him. They exit into a hospital wing decorated in pastel blue and green. Framed prints of Monet's haystacks cover the walls. At one station, two nurses wearing bright patterned scrubs smile at them as they approach the desk. Afaf expects a muted mood to match the hollowness she feels inside. They walk down a corridor past patients' rooms with curtains drawn around the beds. A few doors are closed. A doctor speaks with two women, 
a mother and daughter, Afaf guesses, outside one of the closed rooms. Tears stream down the young girl's face. Mama's room is open, the curtain pulled back from her bed. Her eyes sink in dark circles, her cheeks are gaunt. She looks like an aging sorceress, once beautiful and bright. Her gray hair fans out like silk against the white pillow, pillows. An IV drip hangs beside the bed. Mama's hands are in restraints, black cuffs enclosing her thin wrists. Salam, Baba, sa Baba softly greets her. He sets a small Quran on her bedside. Mama tilts her head in the direction of his voice, pulling her gaze away from the window. Majid immediately moves to her side, gently lifts her hand. He chokes up at Mama's bound wrists. Are, are these really necessary? He asks, sniffling. Afaf is quiet and remains frozen at the door, fring fingering the edge of fresh bandage Majid gently wrapped around her arm. Mama looks feverish and her pupils are dilated. I want to go home, she croaks. Baba holds her other hand, the restraint grazing his fingers. Inshallah, you'll be discharged soon and... No, I want to go home. She tries to lift her arms, but the cuffs only permit them to move a few inches above her body. Home, she repeats, with all the emphasis she can muster for a single word. Afaf glances at Majid and they watch Baba's face drain of blood, the same as when they found her in the tub only a week before. They understand what Mama is asking for. All this time, Mama's been a ghost, wandering the present, searching for a portal to the past where she'd once been a young girl, carefree, nobody's mother, nobody's wife, only Muntaha, free from grief, treading lightly as a child who hasn't known pain beyond a scuffed knee or a sprained ankle, hasn't had a part of herself stolen from her. Afaf had never imagined Mama had any other aspirations beyond motherhood, and she'd sorely failed that in Afaf's eyes, had Mama suppressed other dreams of being someone else, not the mother of a lost child, not the wife of a broken man? Sometime, something washes over Afaf as she studies her mother in restraints, denied any control. For the first time, Afaf sees Mama as a shattered woman. Baba nods at Mama's request, choked up. Whatever you desire, Habibti. Mama turns back to the window and her fingers slip from their hands, letting them go.